I'm Simona Vezzoli, and I will be talking to you uh, about uh, independence, post-colonial ties, and the role of uh, border regime. Uh, I'm just sharing with you some ideas that I have been uh, developing um, over the past uh, year or so. So, uh, while reading the, the literature on the determinants of international migration, I was intrigued by the recurrent use of the notion of post-colonial ties as a dummy variable, so as a yes or a no variable to indicate um, in quantitative studies whether there was a connection between the former colonial state and the former colony. Invariably, what I noticed is that this variable was weakly conceptualized, that the findings were rather ambiguous, and the literature didn't provide explanations of why these post-colonial ties seem to matter in some instances and not in others. And this triggered more questions for me, and I started wondering what does colonialism mean for migration? And what about the decolonization process? What does it do to existing historical migration patterns? And do we see the emergence of new migration patterns? So I started thinking about how do we conceive of uh, uh, independence in uh, uh, the study of international migration? What elements do we believe that are important uh, to migration? And how do we expect these elements to uh, affect international migration? Oh la la. Uh, okay. All right, so to start with, um, Independence has been generally conceptualized as a moment in which political and economic uncertainties are very high. And this seems to lead to a high propensity for migration. Now, independence also means that there's going to be the establishment of a border regime. And by border regime, I mean a set of policies that aim to regulate, control the movement of individuals. And in this border regime, I include uh, uh, citizenship, changes of citizenship, uh, border controls, visas, uh, and so on. And so the idea is that with the establishment of a border regime, you have the reduction of emigration. But we might have actually uh, an increase of emigration before uh, the policy constraints are enacted. And thirdly, we have the formation of, of networks, uh, which might actually overcome some of the barriers that are imposed by uh, uh, independence and the border regime. Now, a colony may not obtain independence, though. A colony may become a dependent territory. And what this means is that it will have some level of autonomy, so it's no longer totally controlled by the former colonial state, uh, but in general, it's still dependent uh, from the uh, former colonial state. Now, one important aspect of a non-sovereign country is that it retains forms of citizenship that allow free or relatively free migration to the former colonial state. So I identify two main characteristics then of a non-sovereign country. It has greater political and economic stability, which would, we would think that it uh, triggers less emigration than in an independence, uh, independent country. Uh, at the same time, a weak border regime may allow the migration of individuals that would not be able to migrate otherwise, such as individuals who are low skilled, uh, uh, individuals who might just migrate for uh, economic uh, opportunities for jobs. The third way in which we think about colonialism and post-colonialism in international migration studies is post-colonial ties. So we generally just think of post-colonial ties as a package of factors, which include language, cultural, similar institution, uh, educational also similarities, um, as well as privileged relations between uh, a former uh, colony and a former colonial state, which seem to um, affect positively uh, migration, so facilitate migration to the former colonial state. When I started looking at uh, specifically uh, more applied cases of independence, I looked spe uh, more specifically at the Caribbean region. And I did that because uh, uh, we see a significant process of decolonization starting in the 1960s, and also because in the Caribbean region we see both independent countries and also non-sovereign states. In particular, my attention was drawn um, by the Trigayanas. And the Trigayanas are in the northeastern part of South America. And I showed them up because generally not many people know where they are. Uh, <laughs> and they are Guyana is a former British colony, Suriname is a former Dutch colony, and French Guyana is uh, a dep department of France. So it is officially France. It's an integral part of France, as if it was Provence. <laughs> so, why did I look at these three, uh, the three Guyanas? 
Well, first of all, it's because uh, uh, they have very similar setups. They are countries that are largely occupied by the uh, Amazon forest, actually, so it's inhabited just along the coast. They have very similar plantation economies in their history, so a very diverse uh, population, um, and also a very similar economic uh, opportunities, economic resources. But also what I found interesting was that their migration was, seemed to be very, very similar in the 1960s. So as a percentage of the total population, uh, they all had about, uh, below 10% of their population abroad. But things started changing very rapidly in the 1970s into the 1980s. And what seemed to have happened is that for Guyana and Suriname, there was independence in 1966, 1975, respectively. However, although we could say that independence seems to be associated with increasing migration, it would not explain why in Guyana we see uh, actually a decrease of population abroad across independence. So from 1960 to 1970, we have a drop in population of abroad. So what I was looking at distinct evolutions of, migra of migration and even what seem to be different reactions to independence. Then I looked at where the individuals who are abroad from these three countries are located, or, or better, uh, how, uh, how frequently are they in the former colonial state? And Suriname, in the middle, for Surinamese, the Netherlands is the destination, practically. Most of the Surinamese have been going to uh, the Netherlands, but this is not the case of the Guyanese, who were present at about 30% of all Guyanese abroad were in uh, the UK in 1960, but we have had a drastic decline, including a, a severe drop in 1970. Now, there might be a little bit of a problem with the data, but actually I have found uh, through my qualitative work that there were people who were returning and there were also people who were going from the UK to North America. So the drop in the UK, actually, uh, there is some truth to that, although perhaps not so drastic. And then for the French Guyanese, um, we see that uh, we would expect with free, free movement to see a lot more individuals going towards France um, in order to take advantage of the opportunities there. But actually, France is not a big destination for the French Guyanese at all. So what I realized is that we need perhaps to ask a few more questions about what we know about independence. Um, what does independence mean for the population and what does this meaning mean in terms of influence in migration? So we usually think of uh, this period as a, a moment of high uncertainty, which we cannot deny, but we also cannot deny the fact that for some individuals this is a moment of excitement. This is when your country, uh, you actually may be able to play a role in the development of your country. And this is particularly important for potential returnees, people who have acquired skills abroad and may be able to gain some positions of prestige in the uh, newly independent country. Uh, second, what are the characteristics of a border regime? Sometimes we talk about full closing of the, bear, of the border, sometimes we, call, we, we talk about privileged relations. So what is it? What, what happens and what are some of the, the nuances? And most of all, when are uh, border regimes established? And lastly, how and when do post-colonial ties affect uh, migration towards the former colonial state? Oops, went too fast. So at this point, then I thought, this is quite a very nice uh, way um, uh, moment of structural changes, of uh, a transition of political status, and it would be interesting to see how do the migration substitution effects that have been hypothesized by Hein can help us understand this transition in terms of intertemporal substitution effects, or now or never migration, categorical shift, or spatial uh, dis diffusion. Um, yeah. So. So what I did then, I developed some hypothetical scenarios to, to help me uh, process uh, this information and what I've learned about uh, this transition. So I started with the baseline situation whereby independence corresponds with the establishment of a border regime. So this is expected to produce an intertemporal substitution effect as people attempt to leave because of the anxiety of independence, so the uncertainty, as well as because of the barriers of to migration that will be imposed by the former colonial state in the future. Now, after independence and border regime, people who are still wishing to emigrate will have to use specific entry channels, which might not be what they intended to use in the first place, so rather than going as workers or former citizens who are going to explore, they have to choose a specific category. 
including undocumented migration, um, while for other individuals, perhaps unable to utilize any of the available migration categories in the former colonial state, emigration to alternative destination may become a viable substitute. And then I looked at Guyana and I realized, well, okay, we don't have one peak that I would expect, but we have two peaks here. And uh, I, it became clear to me that actually independence and border regime does not necessarily happen at the same time. And this is an assumption that we often make. We don't question when do these events happen. And for Guyana, we have the closure of the border by the UK in 1962, which is followed by independence in 1966. So what we see in this case then, we have a first intertemporal substitution effect before the establishment of the border regime, which is followed by a second, possibly lower intertemporal effect before independence. After the establishment of a border regime, people who want to migrate may have to resort to a categorical shift, so to use a category that's available for them to migrate, while other people may look for opportunities elsewhere in alternative destination. And this is important, in spite of the fact that they're still citizens of the former colonial state. So there's still a connection, a political connection, but they can no longer go there, so they choose an alternative destination. And then I looked at Suriname, and uh, Hein already gave you a preview of, of uh, Suriname. But what was very fascinating is that in this case, we have the reverse sequence of events. We have independence that happens five years before the total closure of the border. So what do we expect from this? Well, we also have two peaks rather than one peak in the my baseline model, with the first peak very large due to the uncertainty feeling of independence. And a second pick that uh, might be lower, which reflects those individuals who aim to migrate because they, they are mi uh, migration prone, but also those individuals who might be unhappy with the performance of the newly independent country. So it's only, uh, what is distinct about this model is that this interim period, all of those who want to migrate have the freedom to migrate. So they are no longer citizen of the Netherlands in this case, but they still enjoy the freedom to move. And so they are able to do so. It's only after the establishment of the border regime that we see a categorical and a spatial uh, substitution effect. Now the spatial substitution effect would be less dominant in this, than in the previous model because large migrant communities in the former colonial state have been created. And also there's a general lack of, of knowledge of alternative destinations. So it's, the experience is very low and it's very difficult for them. Their worldview seems to have excluded alternative destination. And so these alternative destinations are, are less attractive. And lastly, French Guyana. French Guyana is a bit uh, of a complicated case, but for this, uh, for this presentation, let's just say that although emigration from French Guyana is actually increasing. It is still much, much, much lower than what we see in Guyana and Suriname, and it's the lowest among the non-sovereign states in the Caribbean. So it's still quite a specific case. And uh, in this case, this model does, is, is just showing us what might happen when we don't have independence and we don't have the closure of the border. And I suggest that even in this case, we may have some movement that's generated perhaps by the dissatisfaction of being a continuous, continually a dependent government. Sometimes people say they are still a colony. And so you might see individuals who leave because they uh, perhaps intellectuals or students who are a bit radical. But this migration would be probably quite low. Otherwise, the lack of a border regime suggests that flows may be determined by other factors, as in internal mobility. Uh, and then it would be for study or job opportunities, and they're expected to be directed towards the former colonial state. I just wanna make a point here that although there's not a border regime, this doesn't mean that the state does not intervene in migration. And in fact, the French state intervened very heavily in the Caribbean or in its uh, overseas uh, departments uh, um, by creating recruitment system which turns spontaneous migration flows into very strong migration flows from the islands, for instance, Martinique and Guadeloupe, but French Guyana has not been affected so much. And so my other, the, well, there was, in my research, I go uh, deeper into why would have been some of these factors. To conclude, independence and border regimes uh, seem to affect migration. But I think what is very interesting is the fact that the rationale behind, behind how they drive migration seems to be 
different. And this seems also to affect the fact that different people, different groups of people might be affected by one or the other event. And the timing of these two events uh, also is, seems to be very interesting. They help us explain, uh, it helps us explain the volume and the pattern. So is there one peak or perhaps two peaks? Is, it, is there a long-term migration that follows or do we have a, a rapid decline after independence and the institution of the border regime? Again, uh, destination, of course, it seems to make um, a large difference whether uh, it reinforces post-colonial ties or not. And then lastly, although I didn't talk about it very much here, we can actually understand better the composition of the flows by looking at the various classes that have moved over time, the different ethnic group, groups and even age groups. And to conclude, my models have been really strongly based on the Caribbean and on the Trigayanas, and I would really like to see how do they apply into other contexts.